I'm uh, from a company called ASI Data Science. Let's see if the click works. And at ASI, we believe pretty strongly in artificial intelligence for everyone. Um, now, of course, a lot of people say that. So what does that mean you know, beyond the sort of vaguely pretty words? Well, at the moment, you know, we think that artificial intelligence is the transformational technology of our time. But its value to the rest of human society will only become apparent when it's used in things like hospitals, regular businesses, schools, and governments. So at the moment, there are these incredible organizations, the tech companies, that are very geographically uh, located, or basically all on the West Coast, and own pretty much the, uh, the domain of AI um, uh, for advertising. And you know, I'm a, a huge admirer of those companies, um, but it would be nice to see these technologies spreading out and becoming much, much more relevant um, in the real world. And so I'm here today to tell you about a few examples of what you know, these technologies are already doing, like, that are deployed and actually functioning in the real world. So maybe just a tiny bit of background on ASI. Um, so we uh, do actually do three different um, things. In the first place, we have a fellowship. So this is a two-month program that takes PhDs from you know, all of the sciences and engineering and helps them become data scientists. We get approximately 10% of all the UK's science, engineering, and math PhDs applying to this. And it's a phenomenal source of talent. So if anyone here is either finishing up a PhD or interested in hiring incredibly talented data scientists, you should definitely uh, come talk to us about this program. The second thing um, we do is uh, uh, building and deploying artificial intelligence in the real world. We also um, have a research lab in collaboration with Harvard and UCL. And this is going to have a particular focus on what we call AI safety. So this is making sure that AI is uh, deployed effectively, transparently, in an understandable manner for humans. Now, of course, a lot of people talk about that, but there's relatively little technical research that's going on uh, right now. And so we're going to try and push the bound, or we are pushing the bounds in, in what's possible there. Finally, we've built um, Sherlock. So this is uh, the world's best platform for building and deploying models. Um, if you're, uh, you know, AI, like the tools for doing artificial intelligence, things like Jupyter Notebooks, TensorFlow, are incredibly good if you're a hobbyist. But when you come to deploying things in the real world, working in teams of data scientists over long periods of time, you know, with members changing, then uh, obviously, the, the kind of um, uh, Jupyter Notebook and Dropbox is not going to help. And so we built a tool for people to be able to do that effectively. And so ultimately, what we help organizations do is combine these three things uh, to build capability. So um, help with the strategy, help with the technology, and then help hiring a team to become incredibly competent at this uh, in, in themselves. And so I'm just going to talk through three small examples of artificial intelligence um, deployed in the real world, and then finish up by uh, discussing the work we did with the Home Office, um, which we think is probably the most sophisticated deployment of AI in the UK government, and possibly, therefore, any government uh, in the world, with the possible exception of like NSA and GCHQ. Um, but here's a, here's a very nice example. So, I don't know if uh, any of you guys took the train in today, um, but if you did, you may have experienced some problems with uh, the trains running on time. And interestingly, the major cause of train delays is door failure. So they pull up to a station, open the doors, try and uh, let the passengers out, try and close the doors, and if the doors don't close, they can't depart. But it's just this one tiny little uh, failure on this enormous engineering project. So of course, what you'd really like to do is be able to uh, figure out which doors are going to fail um, ahead of time and send in mechanics. The problem, of course, is that uh, the, the doors fail about 1 in 10,000 open and closing. And that makes it really hard to do any predictive maintenance you basically, or preventative maintenance. You have to essentially um, just uh, uh, repair them when they fail. 
turns out, though, that trains come embedded with loads of sensor sensors, in particular for diagnostic purposes when they're built. And we were able to take that data and um, uh, analyze the door failures and be able to predict a week in advance um, with a 50% likelihood whether a door was going to fail or not. And that means instead of having to wait for it to fail, you can send your mechanics in early, fix it, and get the trains running on time. And so this is now being deployed across the, uh, the train manufacturer's fleet. The second example um, I'd like to talk about is work we did with uh, London Fire Brigade. So you may know that um, fires on the whole are all trending down. It's like a fantastic victory for you know, the fire brigade and all the safety regulations that have been put in place. Um, but when there is a bad fire, London Fire Brigade send in a fire inspector who writes a big report alongside capturing some data. Now, they have 37,000 of these reports. It would take about two years for any person to read, even if they were doing it 24 hours a day. What we were able to do with natural language processing was to uh, extract some information from these uh, topics, uh, from, the, from these reports, and combine it with the data that they'd recorded as well. So that was particularly nice because we were able to find one particular set of fires that were actually increasing on this background trend. And it turned out that they were to do with uh, restaurant ducting. So apparently, um, if you don't clean out the ducts above your, uh, your deep fat fryers frequently enough, um, you get them filled with grease, and of course grease is very flammable, and suddenly they can go up, uh, up in flames. Now, um, because there was geographical information as well, we were able to look at where that was happening, and it may come as no surprise to you that that was basically centered around Edgware Road and Chinatown. Um, but what that means is now the London Fire Brigade can actually target those areas and work with uh, the restaurants to figure out how to clean them um, and be much more effective in rather than having to just respond whenever there was a, a fire. And then the final example before I go on to the, to the terrorism stuff what is, um, is predicting traffic jams. So uh, actually um, it turns out that London, so we work with TfL to um, understand the flow patterns uh, in London. And um, essentially, you can model the whole network of the transport and then gradually add cars to it. And over time, as, I don't know if I have a pointer here, um, as, you, no, as you add cars, the, the, the network gets worse and worse. Eventually, this banana shape is basically indicating that at some point you just overcrowd the network and become, it becomes untenable. Now, it may not surprise you to know that London almost always sits in this area of uh, overcrowded, untenable transport. But, but having this analysis means that you can predict when it's going to go from here, whoops, from here, which is borderline uh, bad, down to here, which is utterly terrible. And so then uh, the idea is that TfL can start making interventions um, like changing traffic lights, uh, signaling and stuff like that to try and uh, reduce the um, strain on the network. Cool. Um, so the next thing, the final example I'm going to talk about is this work we did with the Home Office. So it's actually quite a personal uh, uh, project for me because I was in, in Boston, in, in Harvard, when the marathon bombings happened and then moved back to London when we had the recent spell of attacks here. And as you'll know, um, the problem at the moment with uh, terrorism is less organized cells and more one guy uh, becoming radicalized in their bedroom, renting a van and going on to commit atrocities. And that's really hard for the conventional intelligence agencies to deal with because it's relatively few points in that chain that actually allow them to uh, interject and prevent everything. And so what they would really like is to, uh, to prevent uh, people getting radicalized in the first place. Now, you know, if I'm sure you're like me and just have no idea about the kinds of um, uh, uh, these terrorist videos, what they're like, I had the impression that it would be some guy ranting into a cell phone camera. And it's not that at all. It's extremely well branded, like high quality, uh, very poisonous output. Like there's a lot of effort 
that has gone into making these videos um, be a, as effective propaganda as possible. Huh. So, it's, you know, this is something that the Prime Minister is interested in. So Theresa May has um, said to the tech companies that they need to take down this, uh, these videos within two hours of them being uploaded to prevent them spreading out across the internet and you know, ultimately becoming an almost impossible problem uh, to fix. Of course, people like to focus on the tech giants, and I'm not saying that they don't have a responsibility, but even if Google and Facebook solve this problem overnight, right? There's 400 other uh, different video sharing platforms on which this content has been found on. And so it would just move across. What we actually need to do is raise the waterline across the entire internet to protect from this kind of content. So that was most of the things we said publicly. I'd like to just talk in a bit more detail about the actual work that was done. So obviously there's some things we can't say because of the nature of the work, but um, I'm gonna try and tell you as much as I can. So I, firstly, I deserve very little credit. This was the team um, that actually undertook the work. Now, one thing um, to remember if you're trying to remove content from online is that it has to work at scales that are basically unimaginable. Um, so YouTube gets 20,000 minutes of video uploaded every minute, five million videos a day. And so anything has to work at a very, very high accuracy to actually be effective uh, at all. And in fact, the Home Office came to us and said, if we're gonna make this useful for the tech platforms, we need it to be 0.01% false positive rate. Just to put that in context for you, MNIST, a sort of 30-year-old data set um, that has you know, incredibly, uh, incredible amounts of computer science effort dedicated it to it, the world record on that is 0.23%. So we had to begin by collecting a data set. Now, of course, the Home Office knew that there were a certain set of videos that were associated with atrocities in the past. And then, obviously, you want some uh, random data set collected from YouTube. But you want to be very careful. Like anything, any, uh, any algorithm in this kind of domain, you have to take the ethical considerations um, in from the, from the very beginning. So we worked extremely hard to collect an edge case data set of things like news coverage of propaganda videos, terrorist propaganda videos, counter propaganda videos, things like that to make it as hard as possible for the algorithm. Turns out that if you download a load of terrorist videos, the US government notices you. And for a while we couldn't get around, we couldn't access a whole load of uh, US websites, but we managed to get around that. Um, so it may surprise you um, that we were able to make progress on a problem that, you know, the tech companies have genuinely struggled on. And we now know that probably uh, our algorithms are better than what YouTube actually itself has. And the reason we were able to do this was um, the investment we've made in technology. So we built a platform, Sherlock ML, to make it incredibly easy to build and deploy models. And if you want to talk to anyone about that, we're down in the startup uh, village um, and we can tell you much more about it. So after three months, we'd got down to about a 1% false positive rate. And ultimately, the problem was that actually there are not that many of these videos. There's only a thousand examples. And so when you're trying to train a you know, fairly complicated set of algorithms, um, you just don't have enough data to do a very good job. So of course, the, the nice solution is to create a set of synthetic data. So obviously, we can't talk about this example. But as you probably know, in uh, MNIST, in the handwritten digits, you can imagine rotating them slightly, shearing them, and making them bigger and smaller to expand your data set. And we were able to use similar techniques to make it much uh, larger here. And so then I'm going to just show you a rock curve. Now, um, basically, on the bottom axis, I'm plotting whether the, the algorithm thinks the video is normal, and it is. It's the true negative rate. And then on the vertical axis, the algorithm thinks the video is terrorist, and it is. This is the, the true positive rate. And to give you some context, if you're not used to looking at these, a random classifier, so just totally random uh, algorithm, would look something like this. A useful classifier looks something like that. An outstanding classifier looks like that. And ours uh, look pretty much like this. Right. 
So just to put that in context, um, if you wanted to catch 99% of Daesh propaganda on the internet, that's, you get a 1% false positive rate. So that's 50,000 videos flagged per day. So it's about work for 200 um, human moderators. Maybe affordable to the tech giants, certainly, but perhaps not to a smaller video hosting platform that doesn't have their resources. But if you're happy to run at a 94% um, uh, true positive rate, you can get a 0.05 false positive. Um, so that means that for a platform the size of YouTube, you would need a single human moderator to catch these false positives. And there he is down there. Um, and so how would we imagine deploying this? So we're now in, so actually we decided that um, this was sufficiently important that we should just give the algorithm away for free um, to, well, to home office uh, approved platforms so that they could build it into their backend system. So you can imagine the content being uploaded and then going through our classifier. And for most of it, it just goes straight through and it's published um, directly online. For those that are flagged as, um, as terrorists, you can then uh, either surface them to a human moderator or, or ban them. Um, but in either case, uh, basically you can stop a huge amount. The overwhelming majority of uh, videos can be screened without and removed without ever hitting the web. And most importantly, all of the terrorist videos could now be removed within two hours um, of upload, which would actually achieve the uh, Prime Minister's target um, to stop them spreading. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.